I'm Azima Salim. I'm also an, I was also an intern with Indialog Foundation in 2019, and I'm a volunteer with Indialog Foundation. Uh, I'm also a PhD student. A very warm welcome to all the participants who has joined here, and a heartiest welcome to J uh, Jhelum Chatraj. A uh, brief introductions to Jhelum Chatraj. She'll be speaking on noise cancellation towards a dialogic society today. She is an academic and a poet based in Hyderabad, India. She has authored the books Noise Cancellation, which is poetry, corporate fiction, popular culture, and the new writers and when. Lover leaves and poetry stay. Uh, her works have been published at Colorado Review, World Literature Today Room, Porridge Not Very Quiet, Queen Mob's Tea House, Asian Cha, among others. She received the C CTI Excellence Award in Literature and Soft Skill Development 2019 from the Council for Transforming India and the Development of Language and Culture, Government of Telangana, India. So it's a, uh, a very warm welcome to you, and uh, it's a pleasure listening to you at this session today. Uh, it's up. It, we'll we'll continue the session from three to five. One hour is for the lecture, and next one hour will be for the Q and A. And however way you feel like going through this session, or you want to proceed this session, so it's up to Jhelum. And let's start this session for now. Thank you. Over to you. Uh, Thank you, Azima, for the lovely introduction and uh, welcome all of you, all these students, young minds here. And I'm, I'm a reminder of my PhD days when I also, you know, was associated with the Dialogue Foundation and I used to participate and volunteer for some of their programs. And it's nice to be back here and talking about my book today. So hi, everyone. Hi, Nasser. Hi, Zoya. Hi, Pushpika. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Bezad. And uh, I cannot see everyone else, but hi, everyone. So I will be talking primarily about my latest book, uh, Noise Cancellation. This is my book. And uh, this is a poetry collection. And I'll be connecting, you know, ideas of my book to what you are, you have taken up as a course, you know, the dialogue towards the dialogic society. So most of my concepts or ideas won't be very theoretical because I'm not an expert in dialogue studies, but I will be trying to connect literature and the idea of dialogue and specifically the contribution that poetry can have in developing dialogues between, you know, larger societies, between people, between two hearts in different ways. Okay. So I have a, you know, little presentation. Um, <clears throat> I think I'll share my screen. So um, as I was, you know, preparing a little bit for your talk today, and I came across this uh, uh, phrase, uh, the power of authentic conversations in building dialogue by someone called uh, Scott London. I was reading his article about, you know, how, how dialogue can enhance uh, relationships between nations and what he says that dialogue is only it's not just two people talking but it is two people or two countries or two states or two parties talking in a very effective method and in an authentic way otherwise it's not a dialogue it's a monologue right you're talking to yourself basically and if we, you know, see it um, means if we analyze even our everyday life and, uh, you know, we, we have, I mean, uh, this, right, our, our tool of distraction. So if we analyze, you see, that we are talking to so many people each day, but how many of those conversations are actually, uh, how many of those contribute towards our growth? Only those which will lead you from one frontier to another can be considered as a dialogue. Rest of the time, it is probably, you know, if you're talking, people are not even listening. There's so much of hurry-burry all the time. 
so the power i see poetry comes here as to you know start this whole idea of effectively communicating with um, you know uh, effective communication use effective communication among people so in this sense we see since ages you know poetry has been a source of soft power but soft power is you know i mean a very popular term in cultural studies uh, most of you know that it was coined by joseph nye and in the post uh, in the neoliberal you know in the context of neoliberalization and uh, but if you see i mean poetry was there long before or literature was there long before as soft power right people were communicating across borders through different texts through religious texts or through you know literatures of about heroes mythology all right and here i see that poetry can play a very important and a very substantial role in developing dialogue across people and i have i see that my book you know noise cancellation uh, which was released in 2021 is also something that is suitable to this whole idea because i in my book also you know i talk about sustainable consciousness i mean we're living in an age where we're talking about sustainability in each and every aspect of our lives right but how do you sustain your own mind right there's a we are living in the age of ceaseless information there's phone there's internet there's your own work I mean if you wake up from the moment of course you wake up I wake up with my phone right I I mean I keep it at a different place right but but I wake up in anxiety that okay uh, what messages have come okay and and not just messages it will like there's a linkedin notification there's instagram there's facebook there's um what is there what is um, twitter okay recently i had to join twitter recently um, a month back okay because i have this book people said that no how can how is it that you are not on twitter okay so the whole an entire day opens up with notifications or a, a life that i am living in a parallel world okay a parallel world where i do not have any physical communication i have my digital footprints there but that whole world is now going to control my physical world now and i do not know what's going to happen once meta comes in because meta is going to be internet in real time okay how is it going to inf- uh, you know act upon the idea of dialogue i mean it might change the entire scenario we really do not know but that's what i was i was in a situation where i observed that you know my life in so many ways is being controlled by this thing called internet and consciousness my consciousness of my own life was or my control over my own life was slipping and this was happening in 2009 19 and i came to a state where i decided that you know i mean i have to do something about it and as as a poet as a writer what can you do you can write about it because i cannot complain about it i cannot change it i cannot neglect it either i have to live with it but i can critique it i can critically respond to this idea of your consciousness being burdened by the noise of the digital world and funnily you know um i how the title if you are wondering why is it called noise cancellation and uh, i was i wanted to buy buy a set of headphones and i was just asking my brother you know very casual conversation that can you suggest me something that would be you know something good uh, and he suggested why don't you go for the sony something something and they have these noise cancellation feature you know and that moment was like a, a bomb exploded okay a spiritual bomb i can see so my my spirit bursted into you know 100000 fragments it was a moment of epiphany if you know right epiphany you know is a moment of enlightenment 
that you can't, that you do not know. And it just happens out of a very ordinary moment. And I was like, yeah, noise cancellation. That is what I have to do. I have to cancel all the noise in my life. And I have to build a dialogue within myself. How can I create, how can I have a healthy dialogue with people outside when my inner dialogue is so disturbed? Right. If I come from a disturbed place, I cannot give love, peace or harmony to the outside world. And, uh, you know, every poet or if you see every poem, you were also saying Pushpika that I wrote it. And, you know, I mean, I could see the passion on your face. Right. And you said that and I edited it and I don't remember it. But but you can feel that experience in your veins, in your in your skin, in your you can feel that. So the point is every poem is a, a bridge. Right. It's a connection from one point to the other. And you are moving from the point of, you know, uh, what can I say? Un what can I say? From a point of nothing to a point where you have truth, beauty, harmony in a piece of written in a piece, written on a piece of paper with certain words put together. Right. That's when your, your dialogue with yourself is done. So that's what I say, the poet dialogue at a micro and macro level. Individual well-being will lead to collective well-being, our inner dialogue. And that's where noise cancellation, you know, this, this book comes with a very specific purpose. Uh, the, the purpose is to focus and concentrate on what is happening around us and what, what we are experiencing at that point of time. Rather than being constantly anxious or being, you know, constantly disoriented by what has happened or will happen, either in a parallel digital world or in, you know, any other kind of noise happening in your life. And how can you do it? There are certain methods. There's a method to this madness. It's a practice. It's a skill. The skill of, you know, mindfulness, the skill of mindful dialogue, it can't happen over uh, overnight. So it has to happen by certain habits that uh, you, we can, you know, in, you know, sort of start um, inculcating. And if individuals inculcate those habits, then society at large can practice them and we can all have better societies. I mean, based on the foundation of, you know, understanding and respecting each other's cultures and not being in a position where we are constantly seeing anything that is different from us as the other, the process of othering, right? Which is, which is so common when we see something, we were like constantly the, the questioning in our mind. Why can't we embrace things with a positive uh, reception and, and believe in them? And rather than have this culture of, you know, suspicion or skepticism, which is where we, we are currently at this point in this world. If you see, we are living, a, you know, we are technologically progressive, but our minds in, in many ways, we are going back in many ways. And that shouldn't happen. So how do I know? You might ask me that how, how do I address this whole idea? Okay, how do I see poetry building a dialogue or how do I see uh, my book contributing here? The first and foremost thing, you know, is I feel that uh, poetry honors subjectivity. There are different kinds of literature. There are, there you have fiction, you have nonfiction, you have novels, okay. You have autobiographies. And if you observe everything, except poetry is like a person looking out of the window, right? A person is looking, but poetry is like, you are looking within you. Unless you look within you, it is not going to come out of you, right? So, so, so any, a novel would be, you know, something like a, a fiction where you are, you are narrating the world, you're imagining, you necessarily don't have to come inside. In fact, if you come in, if the, author talks about himself or herself in a novel, the novel is probably not going to work. But poetry can work. You can write a poem about simply, you know, kind of 
peeling oranges in the sun on a, on a winter afternoon you are peeling oranges and you're sitting and you know enjoying those oranges and that can be enough to be a successful po that can be enough to develop your own dialogue with your own self and i see poetry does that why because it is honoring your own self your subjective self your relationship with your own self self awareness self consciousness because if, if i am not aware of who i am if i am not holding the reins of the horses that i have trained others are going to run me <laughs> okay and that cannot and if everybody is being run by the other person <laughs> the society will be in a state of anarchy right so we have to bring about the law and order of emotions the law and order in the nasir and poetry can help do that and that is what i have you know many of the poems is of course but not many quite a few are about me disciplining myself okay i can't blame the social media world or my phone all the time but i can discipline myself and tell myself that yeah these are the the hours that i am going to be away from my phone and no matter what happens i am not going to you know i'm not going to touch it okay so on that note i will read uh, for you the title poem of this collection noise cancellation and why i was writing this you know i thought that um i need a structure to i just can't say things how i want to say things so the words in this poem are except i think one or two they're all monosyllabic that means there only there's only one sound coming out of one verb you know syllables are the number of verbs in a words so i mean those of you um, uh, do not know or you have forgotten no problem say like my name is jhelum so my ha- my my name has two syllables e a g l a okay so like pushpika you will be having pushpika so you have three syllables right o e a okay so i wanted this poem also to be a very minimalist poem and how do i how do i do that i thought okay i'll i'll write words that have that each word makes only one sound to me poetry is a lot about the oral sensations you know how you listen to it so it has to be there has to be some control something to i should be slave to something so here it goes noise cancellation yes poor new noise on palms that swell and spill bones bloom on strange beds they don't fear the storm sea of rage sick with the slab of glass phones turn the key click 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 the birth of a sound ah the whip of time lost on a map of lies birds feed the blind sun our eyes buzz like bees i let go i let go dog like i wait at the door of monks milk and hugs i learn to live mind sit eat pray for a change a sweet hint of spring light so it's it's a journey from where i say that you know there has to be even the act of sitting down can be an act of dialogue even the act of eating food is an act of dialogue you see animals dogs cats they'll not eat whatever is given to them if you give a packet of chips they're not going to eat they will eat exactly what they want they know what is good for them but we don't know if someone gives me a bag of chips i'm going to finish it up right now <laughs> although i shouldn't be doing it but but animals you see they can they can eat consciously 
they are practicing the dialogue of self you know they know this is this is what i want this is not what i want but we do not know we have to practice it okay the second point you know how poetry is, we see poetry as dialogue is uh, to question power now you see um, you know we, we as a society we are obsessed with powerful people forbes list of 100 richest people influencers okay 1000 million followers 51 million followers right so uh, we like we like people who are powerful and uh, we 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 kind of put them on a pedestal but what we don't do is also worship those people who question power people who question power are equally important as people who generate power and poets question power because without any questions we are not going to go anywhere you know i'm just reading a bit from an article when power leads man towards arrogance poetry reminds him of his limitations when power narrows the areas of man's concern poetry reminds him of richness and diversity when uh, the artist or the poet you know however faithful to his personal vision of reality becomes the last champion of the individual mind and sensibility against an intrusive society and an officious state the great artist is thus a solitary figure he is like you know what robert frost the american poet says that the all poets and artists always have a lovers quarrel with the world you know how two lovers will always fight but they can't stay without each other at the same time so a poet and the outside world is like that a poet cannot stop interfering into the affairs of the world and a poet cannot stop falling in love <laughs> with the affairs of the world you know so that's why i also say you know that um all lovers can't be poets but all poets are lovers so and uh, you know and if you see that that's what i mean to question power uh if for any healthy dialogue we have to have a situation where two parties are able to question each other without prejudice without personal bias and without uh, hatred which is a rarity in the society that we are living today i mean i am talking about a very utopian you know situation so but we should nothing harm in dreaming if we don't dream how are we going to fulfill our dreams so let's let's hope we have a future society like that and on that note there are several poem that you know question different uh, stuff establishments of power capitalism environmental damage patriarchy even uh, i have questioned even online teaching there's a poem i ran the marathon without shoes where uh, you know when i started teaching this on when i was working on online teaching and initially it was also hunky dory and it was also like ah this is like the revolutionary thing you know this is the future but what happened within a few months was that it resulted in an emotional disconnect and and it and it was just and i teach undergraduates okay they're just out of school and uh, they are not in a mindset to tolerate me on a zoom meeting they have other important things to do in the world they have snapchat they have friends they have cafes to visit right they have to enjoy their lives i mean i, I can't expect them to <laughs> you know emotionally connect with me and but it so i was saying that you know uh, when we moved to offline classes it was so much better it was such a liberating experience so there are many sort of questions that this book also addresses you know different kinds of noise in fact each poem is actually trying to address a certain kind of noise emotional spiritual material gender related I will read for you one very specific poem. Um, it is titled, if you see, if you're, you know, on here at the PPT, it is titled "I Will Fall Sick If You Photograph Me." Okay. 
any one of you um have you been to the andaman islands or anywhere else like that have you been no okay so so i i went to the andaman islands so way back in 2000 um, i think uh, seven you know or oh, no 2006 maybe and if you remember there was a tsunami that happened sometime in 2004 I mean I don't know if you really remember but it was quite a uh, devastating you know and in that tsunami I mean the whole india as the the coastline the, the eastern coastline was affected very badly and after a day or two people thought about like what happened to the tribal people you know the tribes of andamans no one has gone there to save them okay there was a lot of uh, relief packages and everything army navy everyone for the civilized society i mean the so called civilized society but there was no help nobody thought of them like they thought like it's gone i mean they must have perished they were the last of the you know the jarwa tribes i mean the the remnants of such heritage but um, i mean it, it is it, it is a sad thing but you know Okay so so this was the situation so um, after a few days the press trust of india brought out a report declaring that uh, none of the jarwas were harmed all of them are alive in fact the dogs cats butterflies each everyone is alive nothing happened to any one of them okay so how is it possible it was possible because they tapped into their you know indigenous knowledge and they knew that the tsunami is going to come or something is going to happen something bad is coming and they had shifted from the shorelines up in the mountains a week back okay and they were safe and we with all our technological advancements and our satellites and you know whatever we <laughs> we glorify ourselves with we we couldn't save us ourselves so many people died and i was reading a newspaper clip where a photographer a journalist wanted to take a picture of this you know this uh, tribal person the tribal tribe and he said no 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 don't please don't do that you know that that thing that click you make that sound and the flashlight it it makes us sick and uh, that was quite a you know i thought yeah i mean look at this guy i mean he is holding on to what he has his own little hut in the jungle you know and he's valuing his tradition and he has the courage to question the power of the modern civilized technologically advanced man and completely shut him down saying that please go away i don't want your whatever you are glorifying and based on that you know i sort of wrote a poem it's a bit of you know when you write poetry you imagine a little bit as well so i sort of imagine the situation and this poem has been published uh, multiple times in multiple international journals and anthologies of uh, kind of an awareness on where we are you know going in terms of our environmental consciousness and the effects of larger effects of climate change and anthropocene it can be seen from varied perspective so i just read this it's a bit longish of a poem but since you are bound to listen to me you, you can't help it really okay i will fall sick if you photograph me 26 december 2004 in finite decay at the shores of the andamans rumor of apocalypse on streets heavy with the marrow of civilization bones on boats on trees on windows on the collapsed lips of the earth except them they who gathered the mist of moonfall care to speak to the bridal turtle mapped the gloomy haze over hushed waterways released tremulous bird calls from their farms 
They who rose at the edge of the deluge swooned to the wild beats of the dawn and bribed no expensive gods to break into a blossom. Then came the sentinels of Kalka to write on the stunned tongues of technology. The tribes are alive. A triumphant answer to man's search for man. But to the lust of the lenses, said the finite forest child, I will fall sick if you photograph me. He did not wish to become a shadow in the wind or the last wave in the age of rising seas with a bow and arrow on his ash smeared shoulders he departed one last sea lion gaze at the mossy black of the night slow and humming into the woody hollows perhaps a prayer for rain for everyone to drink a little for everyone to bathe a little thank you Um, if I have to move on to my next point, how poetry has dialogue, I mean, it would be to focus on details, you know, um, details and ordinary details, I would say. You know, if you practice a life where very small things start, begin to matter to you, uh, I think we will live a very enriched experience of life. Okay. And at the same time, I'll club these two points. Experience life through senses. You know, kind of being aware of the six senses that you have. Taste, smell, hearing, touch, vision. Right? If we can experience like that, then we can, I mean, our, our inner dialogue will be highly enriched and highly activated. Right, we will be living in a zone of emotionally, emotional proactivism. I can say, okay, not emotionally intelligent. In fact, emotional intelligence is also very not. But be emotionally proactive. Before you hurt someone, you know you're you're about to hurt someone. So you alter, you handle the situation, and and you make it better. Not just you stop it, but you make it better. That is where you are being proactive about it. Okay. And if you see the, all the small things that are happening around us, all the conflicts and controversies, the, the basis is really small. It's tiny. Okay. I mean, even at, if, at, in ac academic conflicts, I mean, you know, it's, it's funny you not know, to see professors fight. Like, I mean, you'll see all these things, right? <laughs> We all, I also see, you know, I also have differences now that I'm also working, okay, I'm also in the shoes of professors. Earlier, I used to laugh at them, like, I was silly, like silly children, they're laughing, but, but now I realize that I'm that silly child too. <laughs> but but I, I'm, I'm getting into a state of awareness when, when before the thing gets out of control, I'm able to see, like, yeah, it is going to be like this, so now I'm going to alter the situation. Okay. So focusing on small details and enjoying them, you know, just to sit by yourself um, and do nothing is also, you know, very important to practice that. And many, uh, quite a few of the poems are, you know, are about nothing is happening, basically. There's a poem called Sari, where the description is only of a wet Sari soaking the light of the sun okay and from that there are other cultural domestic dialogues that are born okay rather than writing directly about feminism there is no need even to write about that but just to watch a sari you know drifting into the air and all those tiny little droplets of water, you know, kind of dripping out of it or, you know, when the wind blows, they're like blowing along with the wind just to see that. And then, then so many, they're spinning so many stories. There's a poem on lizard as well. Are you scared of lizard? Any one of you? Lizards, do they scare you? 
Yes. Yeah, it does. Oh, it does. Yeah. But but I'm fascinated by lizards. You know, when I see them, I like I'll be watching them. Like, yeah, what is it going to do now? Why is it not moving? You know, it's it 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 just kind of fascinates me to see the the level of concentration. If I had that level of concentration, I would have won a Nobel Prize, maybe. <laughs> but I don't have it. Okay, but the lizard has. You know, it'll sit there for like you know hours, and its, it's focus is only on that insect. And when it can eat that insect, and it has that that level of concentration, you know, it has so much to teach us. If 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 I can sit at one place. For ten minutes, that will be a lot, actually, right? So you see, the small things in life have so many lessons to you know give us. Okay, so I'll I'll not read sari or lizard uh, right now. I'll go to something else. As if you see, experiencing life through senses. Uh, there's a poem called Alu Posto. Anyone is a Bengali by chance, or you're you're familiar with? Uh, Anything remotely Bengali, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I love alu postu. Used to eat it uh, growing up, and uh, we would sleep, uh, have a post, uh, you know, uh, eating uh, a siesta after that because it just generally calms you down so much. Yes, Pragya. Thank you. I'm so happy to hear that. So yes, alu postu, and uh, you know. As as a Bengali myself, you know, I've grown up in a home where a lot of alu is eaten. Bengalis eat a lot of potatoes. Like in everything, they have to eat, but you know, drop in a potato. It does. It is not required, but still, there the potato will be there. Okay, so I mean, Bengalis will get offended, but yeah, alu posto is a delicacy. And uh, you know, I I thought poetry is a beautiful way in which you can, um, in you know, awaken these dialogues on cultural memories. Right. I mean, it, it might be that I'm laughing at this point at uh, alu posto, but but that the truth is that if someone brings me a plate of alu posto and some rice, I'm going to eat it up in two seconds. Okay, because I I love it so I love it. and uh, with, the, with the effect that it has so here's a poem on alu posto where i have tried uh, you know I, i wanted readers to experience it um, very viscerally like to really be able to taste it and see it through the description of these words and i see food as such a you know wonderful way of developing dialogues right across people you need not talk but you can just sit with someone and talk about food and you will become friends right and uh, imagine if our political leaders could do that and if leaders at greater level could you know just sit and uh, chat about what they love to eat and what they do not i mean i think uh, many of our conflicts would have been resolved and at india law foundation i mean i'm very happy i was associated with it because uh, turkish people from turkey are very warm and kind and they have great food uh, legacies you know food legends and i have had the scope of enjoying some turkish food um, and um, we had we used to have a lot of conversations over food with our teacher and that bonded us uh, so much so you know this this particular book noise cancellation being a book on you know internal dialogues i so food has to be a part of this book so i i have begun this the first section of the book with food alu posto and the last poem of this section also ends with another food poem phuchka or pani puri you know which i'm sure many of you will also enjoy so i will just read alu posto for you here Alu posto. Imagine a mustard afternoon. The kitchen barefoot on summer's breath. Newspapers mumbling between Baba's thick fingers, and you beneath the high blue Bengal sky wait moist for gorum bhat, bhuli dal. Alu posto. It's no gourmet trick in delight, but a famished melody of ancient wives. 
the slow hum of poppy seeds grounded to a mellow warmth by kaje mashi on the shil noda she dripping beads of clear water on the wet stone wafting fragrance of love sleep as pragya said sleep and war reference to the opium war cute potatoes sliced onions a tender sauna followed by postos drowsy descent into a pool of pallid dream its wood bark aroma a stoic ring of lonely british centuries amid the rich blooms of ophin fields their cruel resolve rising in the steely cry of the kunti scraping sheets of post of skin off the kodai ma serves it in a bati a glaze green chili punctures the air crisp with the nutty whiff of onion seeds on postos soft swollen belly this is what you came home for a distilled escape from the tandoors tarkas the measured spoons of corporate dining posto is a farmer's find unheard by apps and delivery boys a humble hunger hailed by potatoes without the familiar sprinkle of jeera dhania and lal mirch thank you so i hope you enjoyed that and uh, you know i'll just uh, uh, wrap up my session with, uh, with with one last uh, poem i have given the point of cultural bondage right and the boy who loved the where i talk about dialogues i mean i've already said it so i'm going to i'm not going to talk about it separately food and culture as uniting people i'll go to this uh, section of parallel connections okay um what i believe you know parallel connections is as a way of life where you are constantly seeing at very common things and you're trying to find uh, hidden meanings in them especially i think if you observe the li- life of insects animals you know um and if you read a little bit in in mythology or in different kind of studies you will see each animal each uh, insect whatever features they have there is always a, a meaning beyond uh, what we see and i am very much fascinated by dragonflies um uh you know uh, dragonflies are what we call also as sky hunters they're called as sky hunters and uh, i mean what a fascinating life you know you, you you live as a larva you're born under water and you live as a larva more than half of your life and then you grow into this beautiful you know blazing a uh, little creature with such you know powerful eyesight and uh, you know you have those um, you, you what is it called you have those you know horns and then you have this uh, this radiant uh, you know this pair of wings right and uh, I, i think if you see that um, i think we as humans are, like we have nothing okay <laughs> we don't have wings uh, we can't see like them we don't have a 360 degree vision okay and and what is it that a, that a, that a dragonfly cannot do and uh, and they live and how long will that dragonfly live maybe for a week or so right after that they cannot they cannot live so they are living the best moment at the end of their life and the lives end you know when they are at their best uh we don't have that option we have to age uh we have to grow old <laughs> we have to accept our failures <laughs> okay we have to live live along but these creatures are so gifted and i see that they you know dragonflies are symbols of change if your if your house is being visited by a lot of dragonflies then um, uh, i think maybe your life is also at the cusp of a change they they, they symbolize growth they symbolize transformation 
which is what is the most important thing because their lives the, the fulcrum of their lives are rested on a transition on a transformation and and, and i was so fascinated that i, I have dragon flies like you know uh, as my as brooches i have them in small patterns now i'm thinking i'll i'll get a tattoo as well and i'll be the girl with the dragon fly tattoo okay <laughs> and and i always see them you know like uh, you know kind of where i don't see them all the time but i have seen something very strange happening with me whenever uh, this uh, a dragonfly comes and it sits in you know, on the plants in my balcony uh, something changes in my life radically you know it wasn't changing at all and then it changes or maybe i have been able to establish the connection maybe i i do not know but now i'm observing that you know that that whenever it comes i wait like okay so what is going to change what is going to change something is going to alter so here is my spiritual tribute to a, a beautiful creation of nature and uh, my way of connecting developing my own dialogue with the uh, you know outer environment and nature it's called the poem is called when the sky hunter calls all through the summer slight shadows of sky hunters dance to the quiet dazzle of beech and green oh lucifer's ne needle dragonflies are also called that lucifer's needle oh lucifer's needle even i was a nymph in water emptied into a world of dragons where nothing except your flutter could measure the span of intention your fall into light like a seed into a tree you hold the brief brilliance of life on the crisp wings of desire i only felt the freeze of desert nights and almost abandoned the tedious body when light hit us i broke into colors iridescence immense you are the wormhole to all this journey you are when nothing is not your eyes map a splendid your eyes a map of splendid mirrors of some equal universe where words rise from the sweet ruins of rumi in konya cleansing has begun on the night the moon turns stones into stars and hastened headed elves invoked the blessed gazelle you whispered melt like the snow wash yourself off yourself thank you everyone that was my session with all of you i hope uh, i have been able to convey some message based on my book if you like my work you can purchase a copy at amazon uh, or you can connect with me at any of the social media sites instagram twitter anything i'll be happy to be in touch thank you and i look forward to your comments and observations thank you so much jelam and wow this was one of the mesmerizing talk i have listened after so long and quite connected quite connected to it and yeah i mean i was very much you know my soul went into this talk i was connecting myself to the talk you were going you were proceeding with so i, I think you can stop okay stop the sharing and for the participants if anyone has any questions queries comments they can either raise their hands or write their comments uh, in the chat box and during your convers uh, during your talk there were many uh, hot warming yes. uh, comments by the participants and they were you know appreciating your poetry to a great extent so i personally would like as well after listening to all to this talk so i'll uh, without any further ado i'll uh, ask george to uh, raise uh, to ask his question comments or anything he has and unmute himself yeah ma'am thank you so much for your presentation just as if i was listening to a mystic a lot of uh, imagination went through my mind 
Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. My question is about the first point that you dealt saying poetry honors subjectivity. Now, my understanding of poetry is that we look at the external world and then we try to create something in a poetic way. But then how come it can be a means of honoring the subject or disciplining the self? How can poetry uh, discipline a self? Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, thank you for the uh, good question. And very observant of you to have noted that point. Um, what I meant when I said uh, poetry being the only genre of literature that honors subjectivity is that, as I said, you, know, you can write a poem, uh, George, right now about your own experience of this session, right? It could be accepted as a poem, but can you write a novel? You can't write an entire novel, right? You cannot write an entire novel just about yourself, right? You can have an autobiography or you can have a biography, right? But at the same time, the spaces are narrowed. But in an entire poem, if it is also about, if it's just about five, five lines, it can be your own private experiences, right? Because readers are trying to, you know, associate, feel what they want to feel through your expressions. That's what the poet can do. Poets can express ordinary things that only others can feel, but not express, right? There are many things even I feel, but I cannot express this, I cannot articulate it. So I read a poem by someone, a poet I know. Say if you had a heartbreak, okay. Heartbreaks and turns all of us into poets. Okay, let's, <laughs> let's accept that. So but, but, but you, what, would, uh, what would you do without having the devices of writing? You would feel sad about it. You will cry about it all day. Okay, maybe you will try to write a line or two and you will get frustrated. Okay, but if you read a, a sonnet by a, a Shakespeare, or if you read a guzzle, okay, or if you listen to a guzzle, you will feel better. And then you'll want to feel another song, right? Let's say if it's a Bollywood song also, because that song is able to articulate what you are feeling, but you can't articulate that. So that's why I said poetry honors subjectivity. It gives you the tools, you know, of writing about yourself. Now, having said that, can poetry be always about yourself? It can be, but there has to be a technique to it. There is an art to it, right? There is a method. So the central idea can be born of your own emotional experience, but it has to navigate an overall, you know, idea which can be uh, related to the larger cultural or larger, you know, political, social, emotional landscape. Okay. That's what, do, that's what very mature poets would do. Very young, younger poets, when you start out, you know, initially, it'll be all about yourself. I feel this, I feel that. There's a tendency to be autobiographical. But when you grow into mature poet, then you are there in your poems, but you are not visible anywhere else. Nobody can see you. And as you said, the poem point, you said, how can it discipline yourself, right? How can it be, how can it put you in order? Of course, because each poem is an act of submitting to language. You are, poets dedicate their lives in the service of language, right? When you're writing a novel, you have 100 pages to fill. You can explain a situation in one chapter, correct? You have 10 pages, but in poetry, you do not have that, uh, you know, uh, option. If you, you might have thousand words to say, but you have to put it in 10 lines. Okay. Or, you know, you have to put it in five lines, which is why I have a second section in my book where each of the poems are only of five lines, you know, and of 22 syllables. There's a sound pattern. It's a, it's a style of poem called sinking, which has to be written within 22 syllables and five lines. And I do it. It's, it's a painful process. Not me. Many poets do it. But it is because to put me into a discipline. Why should I have the advantage of so many words? Why should I waste words? You know, I see poets as thirsty travelers in a desert. 
you cannot afford to waste words you each word each comma each punctuation has to be meaningful otherwise don't use it so i see it that that is how i see it brings a sense of discipline in you because you know there is a master watching you and that's the poem the structure of the poem you know it, if you deviate <laughs> your poem will fail i don't know if i have answered your question thank you, correctly Nai. but thank you thank you thank you so much nice so much i mean this is something which the academicians should learn from it <laughs> yeah <laughs> So uh, there is one question in the chat box from Unas. He said, "Is there any reason that book cover is a puppy?" Even I was curious about the book cover. It yeah, book very cover. <laughs> yeah, because um, actually there are quite a few dog poems here. Animals are, you know, they're the star of this collection, not human <laughs> beings. So um, quite a few dog poems are there. One is about uh, a lost dog, and. Um, and i thought the emotion of this book um, since it's noise cancellation i wanted to add that touch of that headphones you know the very technical aspect of it but i thought any human figurine would be very incompetent to do that and after a lot of deliberation um, i decided that it has a dog has to be on the cover and it was decided long back it is not now or a sudden decision when 2020 2020 this is the cover that i came up with the dog was different okay we didn't we couldn't get the dog that we wanted so so we got this dog and uh, we took this as a cover page and um, the lives of dogs are very fascinating to me and here you know in hyderabad where i stay here um, uh, i have seen that there are many uh, dogs which are like of high breed dogs you know uh, they could be um, a, a lab i've seen a lab or i've seen these furry dogs you know these very fancy dogs which people often adopt but when they move from here to the us or they go to some other places they leave the dog behind and there are, i've seen many dogs like that on the street okay like they're abandoned you can make out from them okay and uh, i i wonder now, now that their masters or the people that they loved so much are gone life must be so tough for them they have to fight out the street mongrels they have to you know fend for food from the dustbins earlier they had a five star lives right everything was done for them and now they have to fend for themselves so there is there's a poem on that as well and a few few poems which address that so that's why i think uh, a dog is on the cover but i should ideally not be answering this question <laughs> this is an answer you will find one once you read the book uh, the answers will be you know available to you if anyone else has any questions queries comments they are feel free yeah pushpika yeah uh, i just want to thank i'm so much i'm grateful for this session it was literally i am like really feeling ecstatic it's it's it's, it's very refreshing and dragonfly was so happy i was relate to a lot of things in dragonfly so uh, not recently but yeah the last uh, uh, the last um, connection i uh, not connection the last um, moment i spent with the uh, dragonfly i was so fortunate that i saw red De- dragonfly and i'm so much you know in habit of uh just capturing moments i just love capturing moments so i just didn't waste a minute and i just captured it and it was a beautiful capture so yeah thank you so much for this wonderful bombing and ecstatic session so thank you so much and i would like to connect with you and i will definitely going to search you and the book thank you thank you thank you pushpika that that made my day thank you so much <laughs> and everyone i mean lovely comments uh thank you for that um, a lot of comments here about alu posto yeah anything you want to share you want to share your experience of writing it, it can it need not be necessarily about uh, what i spoke if there's something that you can you can ask i'll be i'll be happy to know or if you want to share something as well 
I mean, you can tell me, enlighten me as well. I just wanted to know your opinion about, um, you know, uh, the writing in English versus uh, writing in uh, uh, in our linguistic, our own languages. Not, I mean, English is also our own that way. But uh, I mean, you know, in the local languages, uh, in terms of um, just in terms of dialogue, in terms of reach and uh, how... Um, how is it taken and which is more impactful and in like what are the impacts of writing in english versus what are the impacts of writing in so just like a comparison uh, for especially poetry yeah great question pragya very relevant question um you know thankfully now like in the last i should say 2 to 3 years the landscape of writing in regional languages have grown quite a bit and the reception is also good because uh, there are publication houses or there are people who are coming forward to invest their time and translate it also okay so it's not that regional writers writers writing in bengali hindi odia or malayalam you know they are left at the margins and no one is reading them and many poetry festivals as well which is a good thing you know they also include sessions on regional writing sometimes even parallel with uh, write, poets who are writing in english market wise if you say hindi right writing in hindi and books published in hindi i think they're doing quite well if you check out the amazon uh, best seller list you know monthly if you check out you will see or a weekly most of the time time to see it's a book that is that has been written in hindi okay which is at the number one spot um how i learned this is when um, very surprisingly my book reached the number one spot okay and i was shocked but like as it is people don't buy books like who, who is buying it i mean i had i expected my 20 friends and some few people some 50 people i know they would be buying <laughs> who else would bother to buy a book or you know forget poetry so when my publishers informed that your book is trending in number 1 i was in coma <laughs> so then then i checked up but, but it was not there for a long time initially it was there for a day or two then again it uh, reached that state again it was you know coming down but i said what was constant was hindi literature okay it was there so pragya to answer your question this is a good time to write in regional languages and this is a good time to collaborate with writers who are writing in english as well because i think the age of competition is over we are living in the age of collaboration and people are opening up you know the scene uh, the writing scene is opening up because new people are coming youngsters are there we don't believe in you know mongering among ourselves or pulling each other down rather than uh, help each other and see what can be done for the larger cause of literature so if you're writing and you intend to write and publish a book it's a good time you can definitely try it out and i also had a small comment about mm -hmm. um, you know when we talk about dialogue in general with poetry uh, i work for india pakistan uh, peace and what i've seen is there is a lot of um, um, I, in terms of both art and and, and poetry mm -hmm. especially fairs and you know feminist writings right. of parveen shakir so there's a lot of uh, i think uh, we use fez as our own uh, in terms of although he's only mostly talked about revolutions there and uh, so uh, and and similarly with parveen shakir also her feminist writings and so there's so much that we take from there we we absolutely love coke studio which is also poetry in a way which is just in turn into music uh, but they're most of and in fact they use a lot of uh, coke studio uses a lot of amir khusro um, uh, you know uh, ghazals or or, or couplets etc so so and a lot of them also uh, form the title song of a lot of pakistani drama so i think in terms of poetry again is more borderless and in terms of dialogue i have found in my own work it is something which is very very effective and um, i think there was one case where uh, when uh, uh, when justice kachu was in uh, uh, you know and he uh, 
he requested i think uh, there was some civilian who was who was arrested in pakistan because they crossed the border in adwen without i mean you know not purposely but like by mistake so just to release them uh, he quoted uh, uh, i think uh, i think maybe faiz or some other pakistani poet he wrote a letter to the judiciary in pakistan and just looking at that letter they released him so the, i think there's a lot of diplomacy which can happen just on poetry and that's that's beautiful Oh, absolutely true and uh, you see i mean at the end of the day we all are human beings right and no matter where we are living our idea all of us we want to attain our truest most authentic and the most powerful expression of ourselves and we all use the same tool that's poetry and that that is such an amazing point that it can be used for you know diplomacy and diplomatic dialogues and why not Uh, rather than you know submitting to you know all our political uh, you know all the problems that we have we are talking about utopian situations here but but as i said if we don't dream of utopia uh, can we ever reach there <laughs> thank you pragya that was that is very helpful for me thank you anyone else who have any comments queries or anything to ask I can't see any raised hands or comments or questions. Okay. I, I hope no. I hope you are not bored. <laughs> no, no. I think. Uh, I think they are mesmerized by your poem. They are trying to, you <laughs> okay. know, process it and trying to feel that process because poetry is uh, is a feeling. I believe, like if you feel something, you go and. we read the poetry and it takes you into some other world so maybe the situation is somehow like that so thank It's you so much it's also because we've never uh, we've sort of never uh, experienced a, a lecture which is um, which is you know sort of out of the box like this so i think uh, we've all gained a new tool and i think uh, most of us are probably just figuring out how to use it in our dialogic uh, you know professional work So at least that's what I'm doing. So speaking on behalf of others. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, that that's great. I'm I'm so happy that I'm I was able to do that. Um, uh, thank you for your comment. It was extraordinary. Different talk about dialogues. Yes, thank you, uh, Farkan. Uh, if I'm if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, Farkan Gunner. Thank you. Um. So yeah, I mean, you know, that is where my success comes. If I've if I've been able to affect you in some way, and if I'm able to give you a perspective, it is my success. I mean, I mean, what else can a book do, right? I mean, our idea. I, I can't make a million dollars out of it. Of course, I can't. Right? I can't. But but. i have risked myself because each poem is where you are risking your reputation on paper you know and uh, it, it's a it's a life where i think once you take this is my second book actually uh, and with my second book i understood that you know this life of being a poet is a life of risk it's a life of adventure it's an alternate universe altogether and uh, often it clashes with my life as an academic uh because that life is all about discipline rigor logic okay <laughs> and this life is about being absolutely disobedient divergent no logic at all <laughs> okay so it is it is difficult for me sometimes to be in a space where i have to juxtapose these things or i have to you know rebel and find a space and to come here in a place where i could blend in both with academic idea academic ideas and poetry also has been a great opportunity for me and um, so thank you very much uh, for your uh, yes stimulating dialogue something new to learn absolutely that's what my idea is to give the world uh, especially after this you know terrible pandemic something new and something refreshing to look forward to you know and, and a refreshing perspective absolutely. see things in a different way uh that's what we need that's the need of this hour at this point in the whole wide world to see same things in a different way yeah 
Right. Pragya has very rightly commented abandonment yes. of self. Abandonment of the self Com- completely. You have to forget yourself. You have to, you know, both as a reader and as a writer. You know, if you want to know, sometimes if you want to ask about what is the process, uh, since we have some time, and if you are interested, you know, it's it's one thing to think about poetry. It's another thing to write about it, and it's completely another to put it together in a book and bring it out. that process is a process of extreme hard work and as you have written abandonment of the self you have to forget yourself at that time and you have to let your words you know uh, sort of show you the path that you will be taking because what happens often the conflict is you know i might want to write it in a certain way i think that this is how it should go but the poem demands another way and then finally when you've written it is something else altogether <laughs> the joy of writing poetry is the uncertainty you never know whether you are going to reach the end quite like a, a metaphor for our own lives you know if we know the end of our lives it would be so boring right if you know who would you end up loving or marrying it would it wouldn't be as adventurous but but poetry gives you that adventure and and it gets me high you know it is my drug i can see i mean i, I can say that i don't drink i don't smoke i don't have any habits <laughs> like i'm not addicted to anything but i'm addicted to this uh, sense of uncertainty of really not knowing uh, what's going to happen and just you know as one novelist ray bradbury said that poets and writers are they're always jumping off the cliff of a building and they're building their wings on their way down okay so it, it's a it's a fall that i take and leap of faith and i don't know where i'll land up and with all your comments and all your ideas that you have shared today and the way you have responded i am sure i have landed somewhere good i'm in a good place absolutely and if there is no other questions queries so oh, i would like to yes. end the session and a big congratulations on noise cancellation i think i'll personally have one copy because this is something very uh, refreshing for me especially when you're in the middle of writing thesis and you know having so much of pressure ahead this is something which actually took me to a different space so uh, once again thank you so much for this talk which is actually out of the box and you know very good to hear and i don't know how this one and a half hours went by so and thank you all the participants for listening to this talk very keenly and for the comments and for the questions and queries and everything thank you so much and we'd like to end the session as of now thank you everyone stay well and have a nice weekend ahead enjoy yourself and enjoy the uncertainties that might come your way sometime thank you